I'm David. I'm going to be talking about uh, GraphQL, why it's important, uh, and why it's important to consume GraphQL services um, in the backend, especially in Ruby. Um, but a little bit about myself first. I'm a software engineer at Contentful. I'm currently transitioning into more of an architect role, but I've been doing mostly developer experience stuff, building SDKs, tooling, example documentation, tutorials and things for people to be able to use uh, our service in particular, but other services as well. Uh, I've been a software developer for uh, 10 years now, and I've been doing API design as well uh, in the past. So let's introduce you to what GraphQL is. Who here knows what GraphQL is or has been using GraphQL? Okay, so a, a few of you. Cool, what is GraphQL? GraphQL is an HTTP query interface for graphs. Um, why does this exist? Um, when you have complex uh, applications, maybe a web interface, a mobile app, you start having lots of elements uh, that need to be displayed and maybe a little bit complex. And GraphQL allows us to in interact with all these elements and fetch them all in a centralized way and get all the tailored data that we need exactly. And one of the benefits of that, for example, on the mobile case, is that it allows for minimum data transfer. Uh, in particular, in mobile, when you're dealing with 3G connections or even edge or things like that, you don't want to download all of the internet and its relatives. You just want to download the specific bits that you need to display. Otherwise, you are losing lots of potential bandwidth. Another one of the really nice benefits that GraphQL has is that on a single query, you can have multiple entities, and from those entities, exactly what you need. And in this case, it's very simple, but you could have not just, for example, all users, but all users, and all friends, and all of those things, and the relationships between them on a single query. Another really nice thing is, as it's type safe, uh, it also provides self-documentation, and really nice um, tooling around deprecations, and how to gracefully upgrade or downgrade um, your code base using GraphQL. Also, uh, it's not necessarily a synchronous thing. You can also have subscriptions, which through WebSockets you can fetch the new data at a later point in time. When was GraphQL conceived? In 2012, uh, it was initially internally released. In 2015, it was publicly released and open sourced. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, the last year there was a new development, but who did this? Facebook, um, along with React, it invented a lot of really groundbreaking technologies. One of those is Graph GraphQL, which is what powers actually their web app, their, uh, the messenger app, and all of the mobile um, apps that they have. In, two, in 2018, the GraphQL Foundation was created, and interesting, interestingly enough, it wasn't created by Facebook. It was mostly created by GitHub, Airbnb, and Netflix, and it's hosted uh, uh, under the Linux Foundation, um, and it's open for everyone to join. Um, I personally have joined, my company has joined, and many others have as well. I think around now it's around 100 companies that are supporting the, Graph the GraphQL Foundation. So, what's the landscape of GraphQL today? Still, REST is dominating uh, in the API landscape over GraphQL. This is a given. Uh, REST has many, many years of existence, while GraphQL is relatively new, and it has been out in the public and got streamlined really um, recently. Around 2017 is when it actually started popping up in more than just Facebook. But more companies are willing to bet on it. As I just said, Netflix, GitHub, Airbnb, Shopify, Spotify, and many other really big companies are starting to bet on it. Um, I think Salesforce and some others are also uh, starting to make um, important bets on this technology. Also, just I think two weeks ago was the new uh, ThoughtWorks uh, radar, and it, and it put Apollo GraphQL, not all of GraphQL, but its main server proponent um, onto the adopt. Um, and it was, I think, the only technology that was on the adopt circle for this year. Um, so 
it's really interesting the, the developments that we've had very recently. And just to show you some stats, this is from last year's um, State of JS, which is a survey that goes to all of um, JavaScript developers. And there's some interesting insights we can get out of here. Um, two years ago, almost 20% of the, of the JavaScript population had never heard of GraphQL, while last year, um, that number reduced by 10%. Um, I think that the total number of survey um, developers was around 40,000 people. So this is actually a pretty significant um, decrease in that number. Also, um, there's around 80% of people that um, have heard of, uh, given these numbers, um, in 2017, around 82% per, of people have heard about GraphQL, but only uh, uh, out of those, there's a very small portion that have used it, but out of those who've used it, I think this 11.8% per, um, means around 80 or 90% of satisfaction. In, and in, 20, in 2018, um, the number of people who have used it um, in the past was around 40% of the, uh, uh, the whole, um, oh, actually 30% of the whole population and 20% uh, of those ha uh, would use it again. So uh, a, a similar 80% of um, satisf satisfaction. In 2018, people who have not used it but are interested in using are 62.5% of the JavaScript population. And in total, it's around an 83% of positive outlook. Um, there's lots more, more stats here, but all this means that there's a really, really good outlook on what's to come here. So users are very, very highly satisfied. We can see that around 80% of the people that have used this would use it again, and of the total population, around 80% are actually interested in, in this technology. But uh, it's not a zero bullet. GraphQL does not solve all of your problems. In particular, caching is a terrible story. Um, to build your um, graph API, you have to build resolvers for each kind of node that you want to, to deliver. Um, so that, uh, on the example I showed before, that all users is one of these uh, kind of nodes and you need to build a responder. And if you have nested relationships in that graph, uh, you need to build responders for each of those. And in order to cache a response, uh, you need to, on each of those levels, implement caching. Um, say you have circular references or things like that, the caching story, story becomes extremely hard, especially with how complexity on GraphQL queries is calculated. Uh, it's very interesting, but it's uh, very difficult. Also, errors are not so great. Given that all responses um, from a GraphQL, em all requests to a GraphQL endpoint are to post, um, all the responses you get are actually 200s, um, and are 200s containing error messages, which may be sometimes very cryptic, sometimes maybe easy to parse, but say, how do you difference a validation error from a thing too complex? Uh, you actually have to do it manually. There is no two ways around it. You have to parse the message, and with that message, try to figure something out. Um, it's a, a little bit of a pain to deal with error handling here. Also, GraphQL is almost exclusively on JavaScript. Um, there is a very, very, very good support also for mobile, in particular iOS also for Java with Apollo, which is this technology that um, ThoughtWorks uh, has seen adopt, has a, a framework for servers in JavaScript, uh, iOS, and, and Android, and also for clients in these three technologies. There's also some server support, not by Apollo, but other frameworks in Ruby, there's uh, GraphQL Rails, and Python, there's Graphene, which is also available for Node.js, which are actually really amazing, but for clients, it's a little bit of a wasteland. There's really no support on the backend for clients. Um, I particularly haven't tried on other languages because uh, I'm mostly a Python and Ruby developer, but from what I know, for example, for .NET or Java, is that you actually have to run a direct HTTP queries. So there's no kind of native support. So I'm going to tell you what happened to me when I was actually discovering GraphQL about a year and a half ago. Uh, so we were tasked with, uh, with a hackathon project. We needed to uh, check out some competition. And we decided, since GraphQL was like the 
cool kid on the block in, by the end of 2017, that we would uh, very much look into a competitor that was using GraphQL. And we decided to use Ruby because that's what I knew the most. And we were going to replicate the project I was doing before with um, our API to generate an uh, AR or VR app um, on the static site generated using a, a, static, a static site generator called Middleman in Ruby. And I felt like this. It was a very hard battle. The tooling was definitely not there. I had to have um, uh, separated GraphQL files because there was no language support for the thing. Then I had to read the file into my Ruby code, had used that through a, just a, an HTTP query, received something uh, that wasn't processed at all, um, had no easy access or anything. It felt really, really bad. And a few months back in November, we had this strategic workshop at my company um, and our CTO was saying, yes, GraphQL for us is a top priority. Um, we are about to release this thing. We need to focus all of our efforts into uh, having better GraphQL support. And I was so confused. I didn't understand why this thing was actually valuable. It was a few months ago, I tried this thing and it wasn't working for me at all. Uh, I was trying one of the promised um, solved use case that GraphQL did didn't work. There, there was nothing pleasant about using this thing. But then uh, I talked with a few of my colleagues who were actually implementing Contentful's GraphQL API and with my manager who was also very interested in GraphQL. And I actually saw an opportunity. Um, I, I, I was trying to think what was wrong with GraphQL in particular in Ruby and Python and what could I do to actually make this nice. And my job for the past uh, few years, four or five years, has been creating amazing developer tooling. So with all the lessons learned I have from creating amazing developer tooling, what can I do to actually make this a pleasant experience in Ruby? And brainstorming with my manager, we, th we found out that what if we could write GraphQL in Ruby as Ruby code? So. This is what happened. Today, um, uh, I released um, a gem called GQLI, which actually allows us to do this. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. By the way, last Friday, I released the 1.0 version of this gem. So I'm super excited about that in particular. So what does GQLI um, do? It allows us to write GraphQL queries in native Ruby. And how? Uh, there's a lot of metaprogramming going um, inside that. Actually, not that much, but it's the, the, the tricks are very, very interesting. Uh, I'm going to walk you through a few of them. So basically, what I do is I take Ruby code that looks exactly like GraphQL. I transform that into an AST. And from that, an AST tree is an abstract syntax tree, for those who didn't know. And I then transform that into GraphQL, which is what it's eventually sent as an HTTP request to any GraphQL server. The way I do it is by intercepting all of the unknown methods and then mod modifying their execution context. So this is how in Ruby you intercept a method. You call this um, method called method missing. And in my case, I'm creating a new node and I append it to the, uh, to the nodes that the current node knows and there's some context that's passed through that node. So basically, remember the, the query I, sh I showed before? There's only one difference. Query now takes a parameter, which is a string called home instead of just query space home, and then the rest is the same. And what it does is, of course, all users' name, image, and URL are things that are unknown for our current object, but I'm taking those unknown met methods passing them through the method I just showed you, and then transforming into an AST node. And those AST nodes, what they have is basically a name, a few attributes, in GraphQL you can pass attributes um, for, for example, doing some filtering or sorting or um, a, any kind of um, operation. And then, as you he see here, there's like some uh, curly races which indicate some children. So I pass the context of, those, of the, that children to the node. Um, then uh, I change the evaluation context of that block, which is the, curl, the thing inside the curly braces, 
into the current executing object. So now I'm evaluating that block as part of the current, uh, as part of its parent node. So here, for example, all of from here down to down, it's, um, it's executed within the context of the query, from here down within the context of all users, and from here down within the context of image. And basically from that way I get all the relationships in the tree. Another nice thing that th having this AST allows me to do is to do query validation. Uh, as I told you before at the beginning, GraphQL, one of the really, really nice things it has is that it has a very strict type definition. So whenever you define your GraphQL APIs, alongside with it, you are sending what's your schema um, and how it looks like and all of the operations. So for example, in this case, uh, I'm fetching a cat collection uh, and I'm looking into the items, I'm looking for one called names, but names doesn't exist, name does. Um, so my uh, client allows you to stop the, the request from ever being sent because it knows that the no type doesn't exist for names. And the really nice thing is GQLI uses itself to fetch this validation schema. This is how it looks like. Um, the new version changed, uh, the last GraphQL um, schema version changed this to be called locations instead of having three separate things, but it's mostly the same. Uh, what you see here is actual Ruby code that's um, inside the GQLI gem, and what you see there is a GraphQL query. The only one difference that, if you know GraphQL, you may be noticing is that instead of having triple dots for fragment inclusion, I'm using triple underscores, but that's sadly because the language doesn't allow me to define a method called triple dot, so I had to, to make some compromises. But what you can see is that uh, the translation between GraphQL and Ruby is almost negligible. Uh, you can almost always copy paste from one to the other. And what does this AST validation do? So for each node, there's a few checks. I check if uh, it's a valid directive. There's um, a few, that for example, like includes or skip. Um, the, if the type of the node matches the, the fields of the parent, um, if it's a valid type match node, so uh, for example, if you have triple dot on uh, some type, uh, then in, uh, fetch some particular fields, that's the type match. Um, uh, valid field for the parent node, if the field itself um, is a valid field type, if it can have children, I forgot to, uh, if it can have attributes, um, and then for every children in the tree, I repeat the same, um, the same thing because all of these properties apply to a, at any level of the, of the AST tree. So what are some of the interesting uses that you can have on the backend for uh, GraphQL as a consumer, not as a server? One is uh, rapid application development. The, this has like a bad reputation because people mostly associate it with Ha shipping stuff without testing, but it's actually a really nice way—a a really nice way of um, having things displayed um, very early. You—it's—it's uh, it's a way to um, develop applications with very rapid feedback cycles. Whatever you are doing, you immediately see reflected. Another one is prototyping. Given that RAL is really easy to do with um, GraphQL, prototyping, of course, it's an offspring of that. Uh, as you get these extremely fast um, development cycles, it's really, really easy to prototype and it's really fun and you can do some really cool stuff really easily. And for me, what's the most interesting use case is for schema stitching. Um, one of the limitations I found when trying to do schema stitching before was as I couldn't really uh, fetch stuff from other GraphQL sources um, because the tooling was not there, it was really, really hard to create um, a new schema given different data sources that weren't my, just my database. By having a really nice tool to consume GraphQL, I'm actually able to properly um, enrich my data with other data sources that may be also be um, GraphQL APIs. I wanted to do a demo. Sadly, uh, the hardware setup didn't allow for my machine to be used. Uh, 
So I'm going to be doing this in office hours, maybe tomorrow or Thursday. Um, I'll talk with Michelle about it. Uh, I'm sorry, I, can, I cannot show you the demo. It was um, a, small pro a small prototyping project that did data enrichment uh, with con the Contentful API and some GitHub API, and I, and I was planning to um, do some uh, content model changes in Contentful, so that evolved easily, and I could show you how it uh, that evolution worked um, on the on the code side of things. So, um, so in conclusion, uh, GraphQL is st steadily becoming more popular. Um, for the past few years, it gained an incredible amount of popularity. It's gaining lots of momentum. It's uh, a really amazing tool um, to look into. I even if you don't currently have a use for it, it's a really interesting technology to take into account and to start um, trying things out. Because you may feel like me a year and a half ago where, th where I thought this thing is eh. But actually right now, I'm super in love with this technology. And I'm finding more and more uh, places in which I can play with this and actually include it in serious uh, production code. Also, given that it's um, currently uh, growing so much, there's a lot of room for exploring, for creating new tooling around this, uh, for uh, looking for new ways to, to actually use it. Um, for example, creating my, my library was one of these aha moments that uh, one, one can have. Um, but there's lots more of things to explore. For example, the next thing I want to do is to, uh, I'm a Beam user and I want to have in editor support for having these validations run so I don't actually have to um, have my application code running to fetch the, the, the AST uh, and, the, and do validations on it. So there's lots of tooling, for example, that can be done. And there's lots more um, there to, to actually do. And also, I'm super happy because I got to, uh, on a language that I love, build a tool that I think um, it's really interesting and amazing and I'm really proud of. So I encourage you to do something similar, to, to build the, the tooling that you want to have for the technologies that you want to have. So that's my presentation. Um, thank you very much, and I'm open for any questions.